There have been some interesting messages on global warming over the past few weeks, from President Obama to terrorist Osama bin Laden, and even a commercial that ran during the Super Bowl. And speaking of that commercial, it may have been intended to be funny, but we're told that there are those within the global warming community that want a world just like this. If each of us has to start monitoring our individual carbon footprints, it might be a frightening prediction as well. And even terrorist Osama bin Laden has weighed in on global warming. In a tape released a couple of weeks ago, bin Laden called for the world to boycott American goods and the U.S. dollar, blaming the United States and other industrialized countries for global warming, for hunger, desertification, and the floods across the globe, and called for drastic solutions to global warming. And listen to what happened when President Obama brought up climate change in the State of the Union address last month. I know that there are those who disagree with the overwhelming scientific evidence on climate change. But not exactly a ringing endorsement for the president and Al Gore's viewpoint. I'm hopeful that more and more people are realizing what's at stake and how much we have to lose. Believe it or not, the recent blizzards and the record snowfalls in the east and south are being blamed on global warming. We'll talk about that with one of the most respected climatologists in the world when we come right back. But now, another one of those questions about CO2 from Heather Moore. Thanks, John. The atmospheric content of carbon dioxide is at 390 parts per million today. Now the question is, what were the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere 250 years ago when mankind first began to burn fossil fuels? Here are your multiple choice answers. A, zero. B, 270. C, about one. Or D, no one knows for sure. We'll have the correct answer right after this commercial break. Okay, here again is the question I asked regarding carbon dioxide just before the break. The atmospheric content of carbon dioxide is at 390 parts per million today. The question is, what were the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere 250 years ago when mankind first began to burn fossil fuels? The correct answer is B, 270 parts per million. There has always been CO2 in the atmosphere from natural sources. We have increased it by 120 parts per million. Despite that, CO2 is still a trace gas, having risen from about one quarter of one percent of the atmosphere to one third of one percent. We're going to have another question coming your way in just a few minutes, but for now, let's go back to John Coleman. Thank you, Heather. Dr. John Christie is the state climatologist for the state of Alabama and a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Alabama. He's also an expert on measuring temperatures on Earth via satellite. And he joins us this evening from Huntsville, Alabama. Hello, Dr. Christie. Good evening. It's very nice to have you with us. Dr. Christie, for how many years have NASA been measuring the temperature of our atmosphere by satellite? Well, we've used satellites that NASA designed, but actually NOAA operates and they started about November 1978. So we have a temperature record of uh, almost uh, 32 years now. Are you saying that you actually have a correlated temperature record that runs all those years? We have a temperature record that is continuous since November 1978. Well, Dr. Christie, I guess I'm a bit confused. The NASA Goddard Institute for Space Science at Columbia University in New York City is a branch of NASA and the space agency. Uh, why is NASA doing a study of Earth temperatures up there in New York based on land thermometers instead of using the satellite data that you have been looking at? Well, uh, people do all kinds of, uh, have all kinds of reasons for doing their research. And I think uh, this group initially just wanted to have their own uh, data set of surface temperatures. And uh, we found it to be uh, deficient in many ways. You found it to be what? Uh, we have found that the data set uh, from NASA GIS to be deficient in many ways. We've done some direct comparisons with uh, data sets of the surface that we have created from many stations, compared that directly with this popular data set and found it overstates the warming that's occurring there. Well, and straighten this out for me, please. The temperature data 
uh, from the satellites shows the temperature of the entire atmosphere from the surface, I think, up to the stratosphere. And uh, that's far different, isn't it, from the data from GIS, from GIS temp or from NCDC. Gata, their data shows only the surface temperatures. That's correct. Uh, the surface temperature is actually a very poor way to measure how the greenhouse effect might be operating. You really need to measure the bulk of the atmosphere, the deep mass layer of the atmosphere, and this is the advantage that satellites have, is not only is it global and consistent, but it also measures a quantity that you really want to know about. That's where the greenhouse effect should be the largest and most easily detected. Well, let's get to the bottom line. In your data, do you see the greenhouse effect from carbon dioxide? The signature in our data of carbon dioxide warming or greenhouse warming should be a very uh, clear signal in the tropical atmosphere of significant warming. We don't see that signal in the data. Dr. Christie, you were scheduled to testify before the U.S. Congress yesterday. What happened? Well, uh, our scheduled hearing on global warming uh, that was supposed to be yesterday uh, was postponed <laughs> because <laughs> of uh, two blizzards within five-day time period. And I have seen it in print. I can't believe it. But the global warming alarmists say those blizzards were caused by, quote, global warming. I've seen that quote, too, and I'm a little surprised because... Uh, most people say global warming will actually reduce the kind of forces that make those storms happen, the temperature gradient. So it really doesn't make sense physically to say if there's a lack of snow, it's caused by global warming, and if there's too much snow, it's caused by global warming. I guess you can have it both ways if you really don't have a very well-defined theory. And NASA guess recently issued a news release that the decade 2000 to 2009 was the warmest in the history of Earth. Can you respond to that chart and statement, please. Well, I've heard people uh, having a young Earth hypothesis, but to say that the last decade was the warmest in Earth's history means uh, the Earth's only about seven or eight hundred years old, because there's plenty of evidence to show that even a thousand years ago, the Earth was warmer than today. And when you go back to seven, eight, nine thousand years ago, it was much warmer than it is today. So uh, I don't know where that statement came from. It's certainly not verified by the data we have. Uh, thanks for being with us. When we're taking the temperature of planet Earth, it's important to get good temperature data from the land areas. But since 70% of our planet is covered with water, taking the temperature of the oceans is vitally important. For years, ships at sea would pull up a bucket of seawater every day and stick a thermometer into the water. Slowly, various ocean buoys were added offshore, radioing in their reports. Then in the late 1990s came the Argus buoys, they sample the ocean surface temperature and then dive deep in the water and drift with the underwater currents as we're watching here. Then they resurface and radio back temperature data. This map shows the extensive network of buoys that has been deployed. <laughs> but alas, the scientists behind the buoys, they didn't like the data that came back. This chart shows it. The oceans were cooling about a third of a degree per year. This was admitted by Dr. Joshua Willis of the Jet Propulsion Lab on National Public Radio. He said, quote, there has been a very slight cooling over the buoys five years of observation, unquote. So the Argus buoys have been another backfire for the global warming science.